Okay. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection session today entitled uh, Disaster Preparedness for Caregivers. And we have with us two experts. I'm going to introduce them to you. You may know them already, but we have, I have some new information about Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar, something I didn't know about him. Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar is an associate professor of health service of health science at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He's worked as an educator, researcher, and leader of community-based health programs in the U.S. and Canada for over 15 years. He has a doctorate degree in public health and is credentialed by FEMA, and I'm sure he's going to tell us what FEMA stands for, though many of us already know. Elliot has led disaster preparedness workshops for healthcare centers across Florida, for healthcare centers across Florida, and published research on how this issue affects vulnerable populations such as the elderly, caregivers, and the homeless. Now, Lucy Barilak has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She's presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal, Canada. She's been involved in various research projects and has published numerous articles related to caregiving issues. She's lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy's a consultant for private industry in the United States, including her work with the WellMed Charitable Foundation and their clinics in Texas. And additionally, Lucy would like you to know on a personal note that she was a caregiver for her mother for about 10 years. And with that, Lucy and Elliot, I can't wait what you have to tell us today to hear it. Thank, thank you so much. Well, first and foremost, Evelyn, uh, FEMA stands for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, but really, preparedness is a public health issue. And as a public health um, professional and researcher, um, the area of disaster preparedness is one that I have become very familiar with. Um, and for those of us in the South, uh, like I am, hurricane season is upon us. The official start of hurricane season was actually June 1st, and it does run through November 30th, but we have certainly had storms before and after. Now, the 2022 hurricane forecast was announced at the end of May, and we're calling for another season with above average activity. But today, we're really not going to just talk about hurricanes. Many of the tips for hurricane preparedness apply to any number of disasters, and really, preparing for them is critical. I had a professor and a mentor whose expertise was in disaster preparedness, and he always used to tell me that it's not a question of if, but a question of when. Now, I thought that he was just perhaps a little depressed or gloomy, but as I've gotten older, I've learned that actually he was right. Now, I grew up close to where Lucy lives in Canada, and when I moved to Florida to go to graduate school, we had a tropical storm hit within a few weeks of my relocating. I hadn't even been through orientation in college yet, so I really didn't know what to do, and I was very scared. And so I did what I thought. I bought inflatable pool rafts and I duct taped them to the insides of my windows in case anything would hit the windows. But obviously if a window was going to get blown out, then so would that vinyl pool raft that I had purchased. Now it's something I still talk about because I think it's funny, but it's also in part what motivated me to become much more interested and versed in disaster preparedness. I took classes. I am certified with FEMA, as Evelyn said, um, in a number of different courses that they have. And I actually wound up traveling across Florida to provide disaster preparedness training for federally qualified health centers, including homeless shelters. Now, what always struck me when I worked with individuals experiencing homelessness is that hurricanes really never posed any concern to them. They didn't have a house to worry about, and they had all of their belongings with them at all times. It was something I never really thought about, but it's true if you do think about it. Now, uh, back in June 2009, I was working as a health program manager in this lovely, um, it is actually a historic landmark building on Miami Beach, um, designed by a very famous architect, a few blocks from the ocean. 
And I was running a falls prevention program in the community. And one of our classes was running on the first floor of the building. And I was attending a meeting on the second floor of the building in a conference room that was made of cinder blocks and was soundproof. Out of nowhere, we had a rainstorm that didn't even last an hour. But the amount of rain was something I was not prepared for and I had never seen before. And that was my <laughs> car. <laughs> so as you can imagine, given that this was my car, I had to walk home. I will never, ever, ever forget that walk. Now, aside from that, I was trapped in the building for quite a while where I worked for hours until the water receded sufficiently and people could be evacuated. Now, as I mentioned, we had a group of seniors on the first floor of the building that at this point was flooded along with the elevator shaft. So we were literally carrying people up flights of stairs. Learning how to deal with disasters and crisis was and is a necessary part of living in Florida. And the same is really true for many other parts of the country. So you may want to get a paper and pen for our program today because we will be providing a lot of information, but we'll also be emailing out a copy of today's resources for those who registered. Now, as Evelyn said, remember these sessions are recorded too, and you can certainly refer back to a recording if there was certain information that you found particularly helpful. And after our session today, if you found our program to be helpful, please let us know. Evelyn will tell you more about a post-session survey, but we would always like to get feedback. And we would be happy to also offer additional sessions like this one today, if this is helpful. Um, and this is really the best thing we can do, like I said, is to be prepared and also most importantly, to feel prepared. I think it's especially true right now because we've had a lot of people who've moved into different parts of the country where they may not have the background or experience with different weather systems. I also wanted to add that while we're talking a bit today about hurricanes, as I said, many of the tips can apply to other things, including disasters um, such as tornadoes and floods, and even the winter weather storm that was in Texas um, a couple of years back. Fires. Fires too, absolutely. The difference though with some of these weather events is that we have time to prepare for hurricanes, um, perhaps leaving an area where there may be a fire. Um, and we don't have the same level of time to prepare for weather events necessarily like tornadoes. So having an emergency kit and a grab and go bag can serve well in any disaster. And I'll talk more about that. So since this uh, photo was taken of my car, and I've been living in Florida now for about 18 years, I've been through two category three storms while sheltering in place. Ooh. These are some photos that we took after Hurricane Wilma. Um, one of the best, uh, and, and before um, I forget, this was just this past weekend here in um, South Florida. We did not yet have Tropical Storm Alex that had formed, but we certainly had a lot of rain ahead of it. And um, I took these photos on my television in the comfort and safety of my living room, but uh, you can see that there were certainly other cars that got flooded out over the, the course of the weekend. Uh, now, one of the things that I have learned over this period of time is to store less in my freezer uh, in case we lose power. And instead, I freeze large Ziploc bags full of water. And they form these huge icebergs. Um, but what I've learned is that they melt a lot slower if you put them in a cooler and you're using them to chill other food that you have um, if you don't want it to go bad. So one great tip is to keep uh, large gallon bags of water frozen in your freezer if you have the room for it. Uh, another tip always routinely is every time you're out and you're driving, monitor your fuel level in your car. Make sure that you try to keep your fuel tanks full at this time of the year. Um, and another good practice too is every time I go to the grocery store at this time of the year, I buy a, a jug of water, whether I need it or not. Um, it makes it a lot less uh, intimidating to have to think of going to a store before a storm and loading up on a lot of water, which can be very heavy. I also have batteries and backup chargers for my phone and my iPad, and we'll talk more about that too. Um, even if, uh, if uh, phone calls don't work during an emergency, an important thing for people to know 
is that often text messages can still go through. And if you are in a crisis, you can text um, the number nine, and then I'll leave the other two numbers because I don't want my phone to dial that number for me. But you can also text that number and they do receive messages. I think the most critical, critical thing, aside from all of these great tips and, and tricks that we'll be sharing over the course of our program today, is that managing my anxiety and my stress on a routine basis is one of the best things I have learned that I can do to prepare for a storm, because it helps me to maintain healthy coping skills. Storms are scary. If you look at the photos that I'm showing you right now that were taken over the weekend um, and all of that that rain and that red overhead near where I live, it's, it's scary. Uh, I live on the ground floor. So what I've learned is that through the pandemic, uh, when I'm in a stressful environment, self-care is really, really, really critical. It's the most important thing. Well, thank you for that, Elliot. I was shocked by that picture of your car. <laughs> I know you so many, I never knew you went through that. Anyway, thank you for that, for all those wise words. You know, one of the things that storms always bring is a sense of anxiety, stress, which is normal. I think we have to look at that. You know, strong emotions like fear, sadness, um, or other symptoms of depression are normal as well, as long as they are temporary and don't interfere with daily activities. So that's what we have to keep in mind. In, uh, you know, these emotions, uh, if these emotions last too long or cause other problems, it's a different story. Sometimes stress can be good. It can help you develop skills needed to manage potentially threatening situation. Stress can be harmful, however, when it is pro prolonged or severe enough to make you feel overwhelmed and out of control. And that would be a challenge, you know, your ability to plan, prepare as you might need to ahead of a storm. So I kind of want everyone to be very conscious of the fact that all these fears are normal, but it's how you deal with it. So the best way to manage stress is in hard times are through self-care, exactly what you said, Elliot. It is so important um, because self-care is part of being prepared for a disaster. So if we develop habits uh, that are healthy, it sets us up to cope better with stressful times. So coping techniques like taking breaks, eating healthy foods and exercise can help you prevent and reduce burnout and secondary traumatic stress. So if you need to recognize the signs of burnout and stress and be sure those who need a break and if you do need help, that you do get it. You know, as part of your being prepared planning, think about what you did and how did you manage stress in the past? Go back to other stressful situation and identify how you coped in the past and what was, you know, what was helpful to you because we all have coping skills and we need to use them in stressful situation. And as you said, Elliot, when I feel very, you know, stressed or afraid, or I know there's gonna be a big snowstorm, one of the things that I do is I take 10 big breaths. And that really kind of puts me in a much more balanced state. So each one of you knows what your coping skills are. So first and foremost, you need to acknowledge your feelings. It's okay to feel that way, but now take a deep breath or exercise and move forward. I think those are excellent points. Um, you know, for those who have participated in our programs before, you know what a huge advocate I am of exercise. And um, typically ahead of storms, I would always go for walks until the weather would begin to turn um, because gyms would close and really exercise is my way of coping with stress. Now, Lucy, you talked about taking breaks, which can be sometimes challenging during the thick of a storm if you're sheltering in place, for example. Um, but I think a great example of those breaks are even just to watch something funny um, that is comforting to you, or even if it's just a, a recording, a soundbite, um, something that makes you laugh. I keep snapshots of jokes on my phone in a folder so that if I'm going through a tough time, I can scroll through them. You know, we think of disaster preparedness quite practically, but part of preparing is taking care of our overall health and our well being, which means taking care of our environment. 
So think about the things that you have outside in your environment. Are there tree limbs that you need to trim? Does your garage need to be cleared out from clutter? Um, ours did, and ahead of that weekend storm, let me tell you that was not fun. That was an added stress that I was not anticipating. So these are things that you can do now to start planning and getting yourself organized. And I've learned that helps to alleviate stress. Um, another thing too, a uh, great tip, you know, if you have things outside, consider if you're physically able to move them yourself. What I recognized uh, last year is that we have some potted plants outside that are quite heavy. So I got um, like planter caddies on wheels so that if we do need to move things away, it makes things much easier and I don't have to worry about lifting things. Um, I don't have good knees. My husband doesn't have a good back. So between the two of us, preparing for a storm can be really challenging. So it's important to think about your physical limitations, the things that you might need help with. Think of all of that in advance. It's not part of the normal routine of planning for a storm that people tell you on the news or that you might see published, but these are all just good things to have in mind as we go through hurricane season or fire season or snowstorm season, et cetera. Now, another thing is um, to check if your bathtub drain stops so that you can fill your tub with water if you have to. Um, a lot of people think that this is for the purpose of drinking the water. It is not. Bathtubs are actually much more dirty than we think and have a lot of bacteria. So the filling of a tub is actually used to help drain a toilet if you need to use your toilet and you have no water. So a very important thing also that I think about, especially for caregivers and those of you who are responsible for driving other people around, is where can you safely park your car? These are things that are not obvious parts of hurricane planning, and they're very important whether you have to evacuate or shelter in place. I think one of the hardest things people find is deciding whether to stay or to go if a storm comes. And that answer is going to really be different for everyone. It can be very, very hard to relocate a loved one who may have mobility issues or incontinence issues, or people who wander, for example, as a result of Alzheimer's and dementia. It can be like weighing two bad options. Now that said, it's really important to have an evacuation plan if in fact an evacuation is ordered. So consider where you might go if you had to evacuate. There are special considerations for people with disabilities and you can call 211 to pre-register for a special needs shelter or a shelter that will accept pets if you have them as well. So now that it's early in the season, it's a good time to pre-register and also call 211 to get that information. Now, if you have the means and the ability to stay with friends or family or even at an extended stay hotel, those should be options that you consider first if you can afford to. One thing we don't often consider is that often in these shelters, for example, um, you're using communal bathrooms. Uh, there is no food that's being delivered. It's expected that you bring your own supplies with you. That can be very challenging for a lot of people. And so typically it is always recommended that you try to stay with a loved one or at a hotel first if you can, but that isn't an option for everyone. Now, if you are going to be evacuating and you're doing so by car, an important thing to think about is where you can park safely. Something we don't think about. I live here in Florida. Many people drive away from a coast or inland from a storm because torrential rain can cause flooding like you saw. Now imagine if you evacuated in that car that I had in that photo, how would you be getting home? So that's why it's important to try to park on high ground or in garaged parking. So look for hotels as you're starting to plan that do offer garaged parking. I just began making a list of pet-friendly hotels along major highways in Florida that offered covered parking. My greatest worry is evacuating with my pets by car, staying at the motel off the highway in the middle of nowhere, and then having something happen to my car, making it impossible for me to get home. That's my worst fear. Storms can change course. I was speaking with a cousin of mine who is 90, going to be 91, and she told me this year she's not evacuating under any circumstance because she had a really negative experience the last time she did evacuate. 
um, here in Florida and where the storm wound up traveling to was the place she evacuated to. So if you're caring for someone and planning to evacuate with them, I would also recommend considering the option of staying at an extended stay hotel within a city. Since cities tend to have more choices for parking, and also if there is a power outage, power is often restored to cities faster than in rural areas. It's something we don't think about and she was at a motel off the highway with her son. So had they been in a city, for example, they may have had a better experience. And if you have a loved one who wanders, consider a hotel or a motel with an inside hallway as opposed to those with doors that open to the outside. Also consider having someone with you to provide you with respite. That's very important and an important part of planning. Think about also, does the hotel have many handicap accessible rooms if necessary? These are all important things to consider. And Google can really be an amazing tool right now for your planning. They have maps and photos and reviews online of different hotels and motels. You can look at different routes and options, east, west, north, south, north by northwest, <laughs> and also things that you would want to be near. Grocery stores, for example, pharmacies. What's important to me is to be near a healthcare center. That's another consideration. Planning allows us the luxuries of thinking ahead about all of these things. Now, I know I've shared a lot, and I'm wondering if anyone has any tips or any questions Anything that you might have done in the past that was helpful for you or any questions that you have? So if you're on the phone, please press star six. If you are on Zoom, you can unmute yourself. It was a pretty overwhelming amount of information there, but I think I wrote most of it down. It would be good to have, you, have, your, uh, um, have your podcast that we can look at. So That's anybody- why this will be recorded, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So anybody, um, please. Okay, we've got some chats. Someone wrote that we realized at last power outage in Texas, we could not get out of our garage. That's a very important thing. That's another good thing to learn how to open your garage manually if you have that option. I know I've shared a ton of information, but all of these things are important things to consider for your safety and the safety of the loved ones for whom you're providing care during a storm, which has, in my experience, I've never seen any of these considerations as part of a emergency planning um, kit or exercise. And I think that they're very important. You know, think about, think about, for example, if you have a loved one who wanders, you certainly wouldn't want to be at a motel off the road where they can just walk in or out. It's much better to have a hallway where you can also alert a front desk person to keep an eye out for that, that loved one, for example. So Elliot, does um, Florida or maybe the nation, I don't know, have the reverse 911 capability? So as I was mentioning earlier, there is the ability now to text 911. Um, I believe the reverse 911 option is available too. Um, But in reality, what we've seen, for example, is after Wilma, and I know that is many years ago, people were actually out and surveying the streets once the water receded and trying to find people in their homes um, because communication went down. So that's why it's so important when we're told to evacuate, it's because no, um, no emergency services will be available to us if we need them and we are told to evacuate and we stay. So folks, any questions? Pam, go ahead. Pam, um, yes, uh, I live in Wisconsin and um, your situations in other states they seem pretty important, um, but we have not um, typically seen any of these situations in Wisconsin. I know probably you would say that um, there's no state that would be um, um, safe. (laughs) So can you comment on that? On which part, that no state is safe? Yes. 
Um, well, I, I think each state has its own challenges. For example, in Wisconsin, you may have snowstorms that may cripple infrastructure for a couple of days, mm -hmm. um, which can be difficult. And that was certainly my experience living in Canada. Um, one year we had an infamous ice storm um, that made it really impossible for many weeks for people to uh, have electricity and heat and, and all of these other things, which we saw in Texas just a couple of years back. So right. I think every state has its own challenges, and that's why I think certain parts of the planning are going to vary based upon where you're located. But I think some of these tips that I'm sharing, for example, if you did for, for whatever reason need to evacuate your home, if you have someone that you're caring for that has a disability, you would want to know in advance which options you would have for um, handicap accessible hotels, just as, as an example. I mean, things don't have to be a disaster to be in an emergency situation. There could be a fire in your building um, and you need to evacuate. So it's not even a storm. So these tips are really good to keep in mind, especially if you're a caregiver caring for someone with a disability and any form of dementia. Yeah, I didn't think of that. I and think- we we, we will talk a little bit more in our program today about um, Alzheimer's and dementia, for example, and how darkness alone is very scary. Um, and so as an example, in case of a power failure, we're going to have some creative options um, to share with you, which might apply during winter storms. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. We've got and another you, chat. Yes. I live in a hurricane prone zone and keep an emergency bag in the summer. Be sure to check the batteries on any radios, flashlight, et cetera. Check expiration dates on any foods in the bag. Make sure your contact numbers are current. Those are all excellent, excellent suggestions. Also make sure that your car is in good shape, that you had an oil change recently, that your tire pressure is safe. These are all important things. But I want to talk specifically about medication, actually, which is a very important topic for caregivers. And Lucy, I know that you have programs about safe use of medications. So I was wondering if you could talk about medications in an emergency kit and how to store them properly. Well, thank you for that. This is extremely important. One of the biggest concerns when a hurricane or any disaster approaches and uh, forces people to live to leave their home is running out of prescription medication or medical supplies uh, that patients need on a regular basis to treat chronic condition. So at this time of the year, don't wait to fill your prescription until almost, uh, almost that you're out of it. You know, ask your doctor for a 90 day supply of medication if you can for yourself and for the person to whom you are caring for. Um, that way, you're more likely to have extras on hand for your medication. Go back. This can also save you money, you know, so it's, it's important to do that. Always fill prescriptions on the first day, um, you know, the first day you become eligible for a refill rather than waiting until the day you run out. So if, if you're able to obtain an emergency supply, establish a plan for rotating your go back as, as supply so that it remains up to date. And remember to check medication to ensure that they have not expired. So during an emergency, some states allow pharmacists to dispense an emergency supply of medication without the doctor authorization. But if you know a potential disaster such as a hurricane is coming, is predicted, make sure you have the prescription meds and supplies before it hits. You might also ask your health insurance company to assist you in obtaining enough medication and supplies to have on hand. Now, it's important to know how to store and maintain your medication. Some prescription medication require refrigeration, others may not, but could get damaged by excessive heat, Talk to your pharmacist now about how to handle your medications. If the power goes out, ice packs and cooler bags might be part of your preparation uh, list items. Once you've gathered your supplies, pack the items in an easy to carry water resistant bag and store it in a dry, cool place in your home. 
keep the kid in a secure place that's easy to access in a hurry, but out of reach. For example, a high place, a high shelf in your bedroom, closet is a good place to do that. Check your emergency kit regularly and dispense of and replace any out of date supplies. When I say throw out any damaged medication or pills that are wet or look or smell differently, they could be contaminated by moisture. So I don't want you to throw them into the toilet or into the garbage, just kind of put them aside and when you can return them back to the pharmacy. It's also very important to prepare a detailed list of your prescription medication and any diseases that you or your loved one may have. Keep it with you inside a waterproof zipper bag and give a copy to your emergency contact. You may consider laminating it or making it a pocket or wallet size version and carry it with you at all times or taking a photo of this on your phone. I'm getting good at those things lately. This is also true for your COVID vaccine card. Know how to get medication uh, refills in a disaster area. If your medications get damaged by water or heat, or if you lose them, make sure that you have refills on file and available at national pharmacy chains like Walgreens, CVS, and even stores like Walmart. So be connected with them. Being prepared by keeping a steady supply of your much needed medication is an essential part of your hurricane ready strategy. So I've also said a mouthful about medication. So does anyone have any questions or comment or even suggestions that I might have uh, not said? Please press star six if you're on the phone or just unmute yourself. And we would love to hear from you. It always makes our podcast more interesting because nobody can help a caregiver like another caregiver can. So please, you know, questions, comments, maybe tell us what you did in the, when you were in a situation where you felt like a disaster was headed toward you. Nobody? We did get a comment in the chat box. We work yes. with elderly and disabled clients, some who are deaf. It's important they have extra hearing aid batteries in their to-go kit. Thank you. That's an excellent, excellent point. Yes. Um, in the past, when we have done this session, we also had an excellent question from someone who has a CPAP machine that they use to sleep. And they were concerned about a generator or some sort of a battery backup for that. Now, uh, what I had shared at the time is that you can call 211 in your community to find out about what disaster preparedness assistance might be, a, might be eligible for you. Uh, different communities have different resources and some of those generators and battery backups can be expensive, um, but they do make battery backups now, and this is a good one, um, that you can also charge with solar panels and that last for several hours for things like CPAP machines. So again, think about your different health needs and what you might need to prepare. Um, an important one, Lucy, that you mentioned was having a photo of your COVID vaccine card. Um, and some of you might be wondering why that's needed because shelters in some places wouldn't even ask for it. But what I've learned is that since we're in this evolving period of time with boosters and we may get a fifth one down the road, who knows? What I've learned is that the registry of vaccines, there's quite a delay in recording all of these vaccinations. So it's much easier if you have your own evidence of your vaccine uh, in case you do need to get, for example, a fourth or a fifth booster at some point. Um, and depending again on certain health conditions, certain people who have certain predisposing conditions might wanna have that. We have another question, does Medicare allow pre-fills? We always have things filled for 90 days in advance, um, but refills on many of the drugs are not allowed. So yes, uh, they do allow for pre-fills. You can call um, and ask them. You wouldn't be able, for example, to get two 90-day supplies, but you would be able if you call them to refill your 90-day supply sooner than you might normally be allowed. So for example, in the 30 days prior to you needing to refill as opposed to a week or two. I hope that's helpful. Great. Now, and, go ahead, Evelyn. Oh, I was just gonna say, does anybody else wanna make a comment before we move on? 
or ask a question. Okay. All right. So uh, we mentioned taking photos of important documents. I suggest keeping photos of all important health-related documents, such as insurance cards, power of attorneys, living wills, lists of medications. Um, I know that some people have concerns about privacy and things on your phone, but in my opinion, it's much more convenient and uh, pertinent for you to have a copy of what you need when you need it. Um, so, um, now is a good time, I think, to certainly create electronic copies of all important documents, certainly your prescription medications um, for both you and the person for whom you might be providing care. Um, now, uh, with regards to COVID, um, because case rates are still very high in many parts of the country, I continue to, su I, uh, I suggest that you continue to keep masks, Lysol, and hand sanitizer in your emergency kit or your grab and go bag. If you do wind up in a shelter, you may feel more comfortable having these protections for you and the people that you might be caring for. Now, again, as I said, we need to remember that shelters typically don't provide food or drink. So having water on hand, meal replacement bars and snacks are important. And we'll be sending out this uh, resource that I have here, this disaster supply checklist. Um, and I have included this one because it is updated and it includes uh, COVID supplies. Um, I have one created by the Florida Department of Emergency Management with whom I've worked in the past. And I think this is a pretty comprehensive list of the things that you'd wanna have on hand. Now, even if you plan to shelter in place, it's certainly important to have stuff with you that you can grab and take, for example, into a room where you may be sheltering. And I wanted to talk about some very practical tips for creating a grab and go bag. There are a ton of different resources with different suggestions on how much uh, prescription medication, for example, you should have with you. Some of them say only two to three days um, because that would typically be how long it would take to get emergency assistance dispatched. But other resources say to have as much as two or three weeks of medication. Now, I remember when we've had storms for which people were evacuated and then couldn't get back home for weeks. Um, that happened here in the Florida Keys. So I prefer to, or I tend to advise people to plan for the worst as a way of preparing yourself best. A grab and go bag should include certain over-the-counter medications, uh, clothing, phone chargers, and any other items that you feel you might need depending on health issues. Um, you also want to think of comfort, circumstances, and the health of the person for whom you're providing care. If this feels overwhelming, you can also buy ready-made emergency supply kits online and at stores that contain some of the first aid items and basics that we have here on this list. These items are also great to have on hand if you wind up sheltering in place, just so that you have everything with you in one place if you decide to hunker down. Think about some easy on-off clothes, a couple of sets and also undergarments. Think about clothing that's comfortable, that can be easily washed and dried if you had to. Uh, Velcro shoes and sneakers are always a good idea as well as socks. And incontinence products, not just for an older loved one who might be incontinent, but you, know, you never know, you might be stuck on the road for a longer time than you think in traffic. And I know that's happened to a lot of people who've had to wander into the woods. Um, be sure to keep on hand your physician's name, address, phone numbers, um, anything that is important in that regard. Toiletry items. Um, you might not have access to clean running water, so mouthwash can be an important one. Baby wipes, for example. Uh, for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, lotions and scented lotions can actually be very soothing and can be good to help calm someone down or distract them. As was shared earlier, flashlights and batteries, battery operated radios, cell phone chargers, um, over the counter medications that I talked about. Um, mosquito repellent can be an important one if you have to open up all your windows and it's uh, a damp environment around you. Pain relievers as well. Check with your doctors always first before using anything. We always, always recommend that. Now, um, a 
battery operated fan can actually provide a lot of comfort, but can also help to repel mosquitoes and other flies. Most people don't realize it, um, but if you have gone to the beach, you might notice that there are less mosquitoes typically along the shoreline it's because it tends to be more windy and mosquitoes are actually not very good at flying. So having a fan can help to repel them, um, but also to keep you comfortable. Now, this is a very important one, um, whether you're in Wisconsin or Texas or California or Florida. Um, we know that when there's a power failure in darkness, when there's no light, um, that can be very frightening for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, just as can bright flashlights. They can be scary and also cause agitation. So I urge you all to consider lanterns. Now, a really neat way to create a lantern, if you are creative, is to put an empty um, water jug on top of um, a flashlight as in the photo below. It creates a great lantern and you can see here the glow that it creates. Um, if you um, go on Amazon, uh, the, the lanterns that I have on the upper portion of the slide, you can buy online. Um, I have them actually. What's neat about them is the top panel is a solar panel and you can recharge these outside using daylight. Wow. They also have a, a port for you to be able to charge your cell phone. So you can use it for multiple purposes, um, not only the lantern, but it's great because it also charges the phone and they're very inexpensive. The one that I have here, I think was about $12 on Amazon. Um, now, I don't work for Amazon, but you can find these things anywhere that you need. I just think it's, it's a very important point that many people don't think about. Now, also, if you and your family have special medical needs, you can build a more sophisticated grab-and-go bag. Um, now, the example I was going to provide is one that has extra hearing aid batteries. Um, so I'm grateful that someone suggested that. Um, or you might need an epinephrine auto-injector if you wear glasses. Uh, you may want to have a second pair, or if you wear contact lenses, you may want to have some extra solution, or if you're diabetic, you may want to have some extra syringes on hand. So be sure that you consider what your own health needs are. And now is a really good time to reach out to your local county or city hall to learn about shelters and what resources might be accessible for caregivers during um, during times of, of preparedness, for example. So I wanna add also that I keep all of my own legal documents, my passport, my social security card, my living will, my marriage license in a large waterproof zipper folder that I can easily grab if I have to. And if I don't need to evacuate, I know that all those things are then safe from water, from flooding or, or what have you. Um, and again, you can find those um, waterproof zippered pouches easily, uh, for example, at Walmart, at any local pharmacy, uh, or even on Amazon. So again, I know this is a lot of information, but I wanted to ask if anyone had any specific questions, uh, comments, or anything they wanted to share. Okay, folks, press star six if you're on the phone. Unmute your uh, Zoom if you're Zooming in. We would really love to hear from you. You know, we have a lot of fires in California and we had one that we did get a 911 reverse call mm -hmm. and we could see it and, it and the sky was black, but it, it came 80 miles in eight hours because wow. the, wind, the wind was so strong, the Santa Ana wind. And, you know, you get... You get so scared, as Lucy was talking about, that sense of fear that rises up, you know, that you feel immobilized. And I know Lucy's given us some good information about trying to get out of that place, but it's a very scary place. It is. Yeah. And you gave us some very good tips. I put some things down now. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, as Evelyn was saying, I mean, storms can be the hardest for people with Alzheimer's and dementia and their caregivers. We really have to look at that. You know, if a person with dementia or Alzheimer lives in a residential building or attending a day adult center, it's important for you to learn about its disaster and evacuation plans. Find out who is responsible for evacuating everyone in the event of an emergency. 
you know, you might have sent your loved one, they're going to a special program, and all of a sudden something hits. You need to be prepared so that you don't, you can know how to deal with the anxiety of, uh, of what's going to happen to your loved one. So if you're ev uh, evacuating with someone who suffers from one of these conditions, uh, there are additional things that you want to pack in your grab and go bag, including ID bracelet. That's really important. A recent picture of the person in case of wandering. Um, earphones, I mean, they're great because you could put on music. If there's a lot of noise, they can become very agitated uh, and be very scared. You know, the other thing also is just bring some simple activities like a small photo album, a scrapbook, a coloring book, any favorite item that the person has. Because if they're in a new environment and you see their behavior is changing, you want to distract them, you want, them, uh, you want to make sure that they're comfortable. You know, and also consider enrolling in a wandering response service, such as those offered by the Medicare Alert Foundation. So you can contact the Alzheimer's Association, the 24-7 helpline, which you will have that number, but I'll just repeat it for you now, 800-272-9300 for more information. And we will share all that with you. Would you read so, that again? Would you read that again, Lucy? Sure. 800 272-3900. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, you really have to do your best to keep calm. I know it's hard and you're, you know, that's why I say I take my big breaths and that kind of settles me down. Individuals with any form of dementia uh, take cues from their caregivers. You know, if you're frightened, right. they might not understand, they're gonna get frightened. You know, if they feel you're panicked or anxious, they will sense that and feel unsafe. Uh, keep reassuring them that they are safe and realize that they may not understand what's really going on. So um, use private moments to process your own fears and emotions. Like if you have to step aside for a minute hey, and whatever, you may also find it helpful to call the Alzheimer's Association helpline, the same number that I gave you before, 800-272-3900. And you could speak to a care consultant who can listen and provide support to you. Uh, you know, the preparation for a storm can often generate even more stress than we experience during the actual event. All right, so gathering supplies at the beginning of a hurricane season prevents you from having uh, to manage the stress of last minute storm preparation. So with my personality, I always like to be prepared. I was kind of laughing when you said, I never let my tan go less than half full regardless if it's summer and I'm not expecting any snowstorms, it's just embedded in my brain. Um, Elliot, you address things to take uh, during the evacuation, but when you're sheltering at home, I think maintaining a two week stock of medical supplies, I wanna review that is really very important, uh, including medications, as you said, incontinence products, diabetic supplies, uh, ask your doctor for a prescription, any necessary medication, or even uh, over-the-counter medications that you've used before. Never buy any over-medication, uh, the counter medication without asking the doctor first, and definitely speak to the pharmacist. So if you are remaining at home, if possible, have other people or friends come to your house to shelter with you so you can have respite and help during the storm if it's possible. And again, as you said, Elliot, I don't wanna repeat it, but I think it's important to have personal supplies like baby wipes and uh, mouthwash and antibacteria, hand sanitizers. You know, uh, although local, state and federal resources are coordinated to be available within 72 hours after a storm, or a disaster, it is important to have enough food and water for at least 72 hours, and if possible, a two week supply for you and the person that you're caring for. I think it's also important to establish a safe room, as Elliot told us, an interior room with no windows, uh, bring needed supplies, including battery parts, radios, all the things that we were talking about. I wanna just briefly talk about food. I'm kind of looking at our time. Um, consider nutritious 
your nutrition needs and purchase non-perishable food items that do not require electricity to prepare such as canned and jarred meats, fish like tuna, salmon and chicken, canned fruits, not with, uh, with the syrup, <laughs> try it with, the, with juice, canned vegetable, powdered or evaporated milk, instant coffee, tea, cocoa, nuts, dry fruit are really a good snack to have. Powdered drinks mixed, I'm not into it, but if you don't like to drink water, it kind of makes it taste a little better. Fruit, uh, fruit juice, vegetable juice, uh, soft drinks if you want, small boxes of dried cereal, fresh fruit. Fresh fruit keeps for you know for quite a few days if you don't if it's outside. Obviously, bread, muffins, bagels. Avoid anything with a lot of salt since that increases uh, your thirst. So if you're sheltering in place, you'll want uh, those items that Elliot discussed to put in the grab bag. So that's a lot of information, but I'm sure that um, Elliot always sends all that wonderful information and you can have it. Um, I, I do want to very quickly talk about tips for preventing agitation. Please reassure the person, hold hands or pat your arm, you know, put your arm in his or her shoulder, say things that are going, say things like, it's going to be okay, I'm here. Find outlets for anxiety if you can take a little walk or even around wherever you are. Engage the person in a small little task. Redirect the person's attention if he or she becomes upset. You know, move the person to a safer or quieter place if possible and limit stimulation. Make sure the person takes medication as scheduled, schedule regular meals and maintain a regular uh, schedule as much as you can, especially sleep. Avoid detailed explanations, you know, provide additional assistance um, with all the activities of daily living. Pay attention to cues that the person may be overwhelmed, they're frightened, they're pacing. Remind the person that he or she is in the right place and that they are safe. Um, and the thing is really, it's very, I'm sure you all know these tips, but if someone is agitated, approach the person from the front and use his or her name, use calm, positive statements. Don't get angry at them. If you're getting angry, walk away a little bit. <clears throat> Remember, they might not even know what's going on. So your words mean a lot and, mm -hmm. and don't diminish their fears. So if they're frightened, you can say you're frightened and you want to go home. It's okay. I'm right here with you. Don't argue with the person or try to correct them. Instead, affirm his or their experience, reassure and try to divert their intention. For example, you know, if it's very noisy in the shelter, you could say the noise in this shelter is frightening. Let's see if we can find a quieter spot. Let's I think we lost Lucy there for a moment. Sorry. Uh, we lost you there for a moment. Or I oh, back? Where did you lose me? Where did I go? <laughs> I saw myself. Sorry. You, I know that we're, we're coming up on time. Yeah. Um, and we want to give you, Evelyn, a, a little bit of time to tell us about what's coming up. I will breeze through the rest of our slides here. And again, we will be sharing our resources for those who registered for today. Evelyn, if you want to, I know, I know we're short on time. So if you want to take it away, um, I, I'm okay. just going to go through the slides while you're speaking. Okay. Well, it's mostly housekeeping folks. So you can, you know, multitask here. Um, I just, I want everybody to know that we are going to be sending out a post-session questionnaire. And this is really important because if you're not registered for this session, if you've got the number from somebody else, you won't be getting the resources. So please call our WellMed Charitable Foundation customer service person at 866-390-6491 and get registered. And then you'll get this fabulous list of all of our incredible monthly expert talks um, in addition to getting the resources for today. And the resources are amazing. You know, Elliot and Lucy put together lists of things that you know, just like this presentation where you get both the physical 
stuff that you need, the emotional stuff to go with it, you know, to cope with it. I mean, it's just, they do a, a, an incredible presentation and they've got a bunch more presentations this month. Um, but before I, I actually, there are so many, I don't think I have time to talk about them, but please go and talk to the customer service person and you will get the number, you will get the um, registered so that you will get the calendar because there are a, a wonderful number of uh, presentations. There's also a special series, The Pride of Caring Issues for LGBTQ plus caregivers and professionals that Lucy and Elliot are doing. And the next one is this Thursday, um, The Pride of Aging. Um, and there's one, The Pride of Community and The Pride of Keeping Active. So there's just wonderful things coming up and we want you to have all of that information so before we go, I just want to thank so much, Elliot and Lucy, for the beautiful job that you always do, but all, all the you know, resources that you give us with the research that you do to make sure that we get as much as possible. I personally appreciate it, and I'm sure others do too. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you caregivers who are online or uh, on the phone. You know, what you do is the backbone of long-term care in this country. So thank you. And I would say that I would like to also thank Will the Charitable Foundation because they provide so much support for caregivers in clinics, community centers, teleconnection sessions, and the information filled website that I really encourage you to go on to. So with that, I wanna just thank you all so much. Have a great and safe day. Keep the mask on when it's appropriate. And we hope you will join us again soon. And so I have, uh, yeah. Thank you from the Texas Gulf. Okay, thank you. All right, I am going to stop the recording now. Elliot, Lucy, two last words. I wanna thank everyone so much. Remember to prepare and to keep calm. And I think we've learned a lot of that from our experience of the pandemic. So now is a good time to harness those coping skills and strategies. Thanks everybody. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.